English pen doesn't just fight for freedom of expression. It champions a global exchange of ideas through words, through literature, through journalism. And that's really why our outreach program exists. And before we talk specifically about Brave New Voices, I just wanted to explain about the model overall. Um, the first thing is to say that Penn is a fellowship of writers, and all our workshops are led by writers, such as Shazia Qureshi and Simon Moll, who will be speaking in a moment. And the other is that we tend to work in runs of workshops running between six and eight weeks. And this is, the, uh, this is so that the creative writing um, can be really embedded and really developed, and that the participants have a very safe space to work in. And the aim is obviously to encourage people to express their voices, their stories, and to have the experience of listening to others and building and editing and creating their work. We also tend to publish collections of the writing from the participants. Those collections have ISBM numbers, so a copy becomes part of the British Library. So we're actually encouraging participants to become published new writers. Um, now, we work, we work with prisoners and young offenders. We also work with refugees and asylum seekers and young people in education, both in areas of high poverty and where there are diverse communities where many languages are spoken. Um, and we're also informed by our sister program, Writers in Translation. In your goodie bags, you have this postcard. We're celebrating the 10th anniversary of Writers in Translation, and you'll see information about the World Bookshelf, which now has more than 100 books on it, if you go on the website. Um, and we give out, thanks to funding from the Arts Council and Bloomberg, we give out grants every year to support publishers in publishing and also promoting fantastic literature, both young adult fiction and adult fiction um, and, uh, and non-fiction, um, from other languages into English. Um, and one of those writers is Faiza Gwen, French-Algerian young adult fiction writer. Um, and I'll explain why I'm mentioning her in a moment. A little teaser there. So multi the interest in multilingualism, in people having multilingual skills, is at the heart of what English pen does. Um, now, coming on to Brave New Voices, it started in a small way about four or five years ago, um, and then thanks to funding from Kaluskal Benkin, we were able to develop the project. And we have some basic sort of pillars of the project. One is that there, in the run of workshops, there is a special guest session where, thanks to funding, we get um, a writer from, who's in translation, for instance, Faiza Gwen, and hopefully their translator into English to run a special session for the participants. And indeed, Sarah is only here was the translator for Faiza's work into English and the book Just Like Tomorrow. We held a session in a school in Sixth Form College in Newham, and it was an extraordinary session where people were segueing between Arabic and French and English. It was fast moving, and Sarah can perhaps answer questions later if anybody has them. Um, and the other is that we're working with writers as well as translators. So um, in, a little, in a little while, uh, Simon and Becca Morell, who's our programs coordinator at Penn, will be talking about the latest iteration of Brave New Voices. Thanks to that support from Kaluska Benki, and we now have three years funding from the Limbourne Trust and John Lyons Charity to run this project for three years which means we can really develop and learn from the challenges. And there are many challenges because the project is aimed at young refugees and asylum seekers. You understand, obviously, they have incredibly fractured lives. You may be working with people with university education, people with very low literacy levels. So there are challenges, but we know already from the beginnings of feedback that this work is very important to those who take part and to the refugee centres that we partner with. But before we hear about that latest iteration... Um, Shazia is going to talk about those early days, what worked and what some of the challenges were. Um, so Shazia, may I invite you to come up? Uh, thanks, Louise. I'm setting my timer so I stay within my four minutes. Um, so I'm going to talk very briefly about a project that I ran um, with Knee Parks, uh, with English Pen, between 2010 and 2011. So it was an early version of Brave New Voices and Brave New Word. Um, and the outcome was uh, this book, The Stories of Different Countries. And I'm just going to read a little bit from the introduction. Uh, 
which I wrote. So when Nee Parks and I embarked on a series of reading and writing workshops at the Tricycle Theatre with newly arrived young people from Wembley, our plan was not to have a plan, to be led by the students. And then we met them, bright, exuberant, irrepressible. I think you can tell by that it was quite challenging. <laughs> uh, they kept us on our toes. We couldn't have planned for them. A session that started with a discussion of what we had for breakfast um, might go on to the beloved exercise, adjective, noun, verb, adverb. Not so beloved, as you can imagine. They really hated it. Um, followed by reading a poem on rain by the Ukrainian poet Vasil Holoborodko, and then ending with writing about rain in Beirut, rain in Birmingham. Um, so our students came from over a dozen different countries and spoke two or three languages at least, although many spoke five or six. And these were all new, newly arrived young people um, in sixth form. Some had only been uh, in, the in the UK for about a month. Um, so what worked well within our workshops, and we also had guest, uh, we also had guest writers come in, uh, what worked well was taking pride in languages that everyone spoke and immediately establishing them as experts. Um, so people would sort of compete, oh, you speak five languages, I speak six languages, you know, and do you speak this, I speak that. So that was just a really nice, that was set the tone for the workshops in general, that they were the experts in their languages. Um, also, Nia and I as writers, because we both, we both, uh, you know, our journey to become writers, um, you know, my background, I'm from Pakistan, uh, and uh, I'm, I, I speak, I translate from Spanish and French, and, you know, I speak some Urdu, so it was a little bit about, and, you know, we work as writers, and we love languages, and we love writing and reading. Um, and then uh, poets, uh, people, writers that we had, like uh, the poet uh, Amarjit Chandan, who is, um, who is, uh, writes poems mostly in um, uh, Punjabi, and they're translated into English. And actually, students, um, they were really impressed by a poet, and a po poet who's published. Uh, and they really liked using um, poems in translation. So we had poems from, uh, translated from Punjabi, where you would see we'd have the bilingual versions, and poems translated from Ukrainian, because there's a poet that I quite like, and using them as models for, for creative writing. Um, so that's, those are the things that worked well. The challenges were, um, first of all, language challenges. Some of the students didn't have uh, very much English. So for example, there was um, a student I remember really well um, with the great name of Michael Jordan, who is from the Philippines, and he spoke uh, Tagalog in English, and he did not have a, he didn't have a lot of English. So for many of the writing exercises, we got him to write in Tagalog and then translate it into English, and somehow for them, he was very free to write in Tagalog, and then, and then he would translate it. Um, another way that we worked with that was we, um, we would use very structured exercises so that even if their language, their um, ability in English was not that great, it was really structured and almost fill in the blanks, and then they could expand on that or not. So it was really open and very flexible to everyone, and also peer support, so you, you, we usually had quite a few students that would speak the same language and they would help each other and, you know, this is what that word means. Um, also for me personally, the cultural challenge was that a lot of the boys were from places like, um, well, there were a lot of, we had a lot of students from Syria, Afghanistan, um, um, places like that, and they sort of assumed that Ni nee was the one in charge because he was male and so very often, you know, <laughs> I'd be saying, you know, I would be trying to get their attention. And for me, that was very interesting. And, you know, it was something that I found quite challenging at the time, but that was, that was to me, also quite interesting in terms of cultural. Uh, and I didn't have much support from the teacher, so that made that equally interesting, <laughs> I suppose. Um, I'm just going to read very quickly uh, one very little poem. So this is by Bahar, and he was, boy, he was a handful. Um, he's from Iraq, and he speaks Arabic, Swedish, and English. Where I was born, there was no happiness. People were running, some were screaming. It was raining, but not water, bombs, and bullets were falling from the sky to the ground. When I came to Sweden, I was dreaming about flying into space. If I could build my own space plane to fly with, then I will be the first young boy in space.
Um, okay, and that's my four minutes. Thanks. <laughs> Wonderful event to be part of. I've been doing work with uh, refugees of different ages for, for a while now, and it never stops being uh, very exciting and scary and important work. And yeah, it's just great to be here to be talking about this today. The specific project that I wanted to speak about is uh, it's been creative reading and writing sessions with a group of refugees, mostly early to mid 20s. We've done one evening session a week for eight weeks. Uh, due to my skill set and experience, the, the main creative focus has been poetry and spoken word. Um, all the participants are already connected with the forum, which is where the workshops took place. That's a community hub in Labrook Grove that supports the integration of migrants and refugees. Um, in terms of, like, all of them spoke loads of languages, and we said about making them an expert, like, very much, like, it's a scary, it's like, I, I only speak English, um, so straight away, just to come in and be like, yeah, you, you lot are all, like, more <laughs> linguistically experienced and so it's very much as opposed to me running a workshop session it quite quickly develops into something on more equal footing than that in quite a different and fun and exciting way uh, our aims for the project were to foreground the experience of, of young refugees and to celebrate their multilingualism i'm gonna focus pretty much just on the first session hopefully that will allow a bit of an insight into the wide experience of it so I come in and I see this guy sitting there, he's looking down at the desk. Uh, he kind of speaks quite quietly to me, it's a very clumsy English, and he looks down again, and a little bit of my brain, like I can't really help it, but instantly I decide that this is gonna be difficult, like he's not gonna want to write. Uh, maybe he won't be able to take part in what I've got planned, will any of the people be able to? And so I get out of my session plan, and it's like, oh, this is just a normal session that I do with fluent English speaker, and I've consciously decided not to change it, just so, because I feel like the content is the content, I don't need to, adjust that in anticipation of anything, but still I get the fear a little bit. Um, and multilingualism has come about for these people because of the often traumatic journeys that they've made between numerous countries, often over the course of years. And that means it's very important to use approaches, especially at first, which uh, don't demand or ask of them delving into the past. And that includes not asking for happy memories, as if that's naturally something that everybody has on tap. And so our start point in this first session is clothes, after some fun group exercises, like to all get to know each other and to build the skills that we're gonna need in the main writing session. Each person picks an item of clothing that they can picture clearly and they want to write or think more about. It could be some trainers that they want or a favorite hat they've got with them or a coat that belongs to their father. Just examples, but crucially the choice is theirs. So you can go as deep as you wish or, or not. Um, I ask them a, a series of simple prompts to gather some sensory details, some quick thoughts or ideas in note form. Uh, they return and then flesh out those notes with support if needed. So that means maybe they speak the additions and somebody else writes it down for them, or they continue alone in note form, pulling out key phrases which might act as a spark for some more expansive spoken material. So I, I see writing as more the act of creation as opposed to purely the pen to, to paper, really. Um, and even by that point in the first session, we found a shared language as a group, which is a form of English that exists very much in the present. It's a simple, direct English. It's kind of stripped of everything except the bare essential elements of action. And actually that works brilliantly for poetry. We're transporting every image or thought or moment very vividly to, to right now, almost through necessity. Uh, and so this first guy, that's, uh, he's still been pretty quiet. He hasn't written much at all, but he insists that he's finished. Like this little shy smile comes up. So we come round to him in the circle and he looks maybe once or twice at his page. But he tells us this great story about a pair of very nice shoes that he had to fix as a 14-year-old working in Iran. Only to put a huge needle for his finger in the process and spoil the shoes and then get given the shoes and clean them up and still have the shoes now, 10 years later. How both these shoes will fit both your feet and make a tap, tap, tap when you walk. And because he cleaned them so well, you cannot see the blood. <laughs> and the story's told well, but obviously there's words or sections of it that he's struggling with. And I say to him, oh, can you, like for me, because I'd love to hear it, write some of the bits down in another language that you're more comfortable in. And he puts his head down and he just goes at it like nonstop. And for me, the, the letters, and the, they're more shapes and squiggles and they're beautiful. And like suddenly he's creating them so quick. And then he shares it back and he's got the same story but in a mix of four different languages. He moves from his mother tongue, this is how he describes them, to English, to his father's tongue, to Urdu. And he's picked the bits he felt would sound best in each. And also maybe it's interesting what someone else said earlier, the act of translation allows the focus on English 
to improve in some way. The actual translating process is part of the redrafting and creative process. And uh, so his, his very nice shoes are now the stylish black shoes. And it's just, it's just amazing to see that's like, there's a minor difference, but also it is a major difference. Someone says some nice shoes, you're like, yeah, all right, you kind of, but the stylish black shoes come in and he has to fix it. Yeah, so anyway, this technique, he uses it in necessity, perhaps initially, plurilingualism, mixing, wet, but, but something creatively powerful and exciting comes out of that. And we're able to rightly celebrate that for the, for the skill and the intelligence and the courage that he needed to bring that piece out into the room. And uh, yeah, it was just, just a wonderful experience, really, like to, to see that happen and to, and, and to know that, although I didn't consciously or want to make that judgment initially about what it was going to be like, we all do those things in our heads at various points and to be aware of that and to have it so instantly just like squashed away, it was, yeah, it's just brilliant, man. Like very, uh, very refreshing to, to have your own perceptions questioned like that. The outcomes of it, just real quick, overall for the project, increased skills in creative writing, uh, perhaps more importantly as well, an increased belief that what, what each of them as individuals have to say and the voice that they naturally say it in is valid or valuable and, and valued. Uh, one participant's been asking for books, apparently, ever since the start of the project. Not to us, like to the forum where he goes. And he's got no formal education ever, and he's never asked them for books before. Um, we're going to publish this draft pamphlet of their work. Maybe some of them are going to come with me to the Arcola to see a, a show that's on there called Nine Lives, which is about uh, refugee experience. Uh, the challenge is, next time I think we'd need an on-site liaison between us and the group itself, like a rep maybe from the, to the centre, to, to for just the arrangements between them and just the practical stuff basically has been a lot more time consuming, understandably perhaps than we thought, and that's taken uh, time. Working with different languages, as I said, it does mean engaging with diverse experiences. So particular one participant, his story is like heartbreaking and quite sensational and it spills out of him and he doesn't want to share it, but he can't share anything else. And so how to manage the heaviness of that story, which he very much wants to put out, but in the context of the space and having room for other participants' stories. And whilst that is about the language, it's also about the route that he's come to have in those other languages. And I think, in a way, the main thing that I, th I think is it's, it's moved to a place very much of being almost story sharing sessions as opposed to creative writing workshops. It's a place where we come and try and give each other stories. And yeah, yeah, so that, that's basically what we've been up to. And I think, have we got time for questions that I managed to get through? All right, cool. <laughs>